Hey, hump day edition of Birds 365. Wednesday got together with McMullen, McDonald, and Mikey Gill, who's talking to someone else other than us. Do you, do you need a minute here, Mike? We're just being That's told it. that the uh, 1.1 billion uh, lottery was hit in New Jersey today. So. Wow, really? 1.1 1 billion. Did we win? Well, I got off the plane last night though. at 3 a.m. I was wow. delayed four times. Oh, Ooh. shit. That stinks. Tampa? So you, did, you didn't get back in time to buy a ticket, so you have no chance of winning is what exactly. you're telling us. Exactly. That, uh, Atlantic City to Tampa route? Is that where Mike Gill went? Yeah. I was on the Atlantic Tampa to Atlantic City. City. It was supposed to leave at 9.50. It left at 12. 50. Oh, that's Ooh, that's tough. Right. Well, uh, we but you're a gamer. Game. We're good. Yeah, we're glad you got up. Um, Maya Copas. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm not. They did give me a fifty dollar voucher. Wow, fifty oh, got a fifty wow, spot 50. out of it. You didn't even yeah. get to turn that into lottery ticket. I that's have to use by June twenty fourth, though. <laughs> See, that's such a loss leader. That's crap. All right, all right, forget your, your traveling itinerary. Let's talk birds. Um, <laughs> here's one of the questions I came out of. Have you, you had a chance to catch all the Sirianni slash Lori uh, diatribes yesterday at the uh, owners' meetings? Um, I'm kind of off on a jag this morning about Sirianni and his ability to put together a staff, hire his coaching staff. Um, were you surprised yesterday when he said, when I hired Kellen Moore? That was Nick Sirianni's. That wasn't, uh, that's a direct quote. That's not paraphrasing. I hired Kellen Moore. Does that scare you at all, Mike? Well, I happened to be on the last time he said that, and you asked me about that, and we were a little surprised that he kind of, it almost like he went out of his way to say that. He did it again yesterday. Same thing. I had the same exact response. Now, at first, you were like, he kind of went out of his way to do that. But did it change at all when Lori also stuck to the story? No, I, I, I kind of phrased it here. as, you know, Nick reading the room. Like Nick is smart enough to know that if he walked in there and said, yeah, no changes, Brian's coming back, uh, then he's probably. So does it really matter if he was ordered to or he understood he had to, I guess? Well, my because question. Jeffrey yesterday <laughs> said, you know, he, I like the fact that he came up and, and picked these kind of picked these guys uh, uh, more and, and Fangio. Like they, it almost seemed like him and Roseman, which I thought was interesting because for the first time in my life, I felt like, huh. Was he kind of questioning Roseman as well? Because he was like, Roseman and Sirianni came, and I liked their plan. As if they were together on this, like, hey, we're in some hot water here. We need to get together. And now, that's the first time I've ever been like, because to me, I feel like Lori and Roseman are, as long as Lori's here, Roseman's here. He's got a lifetime pass as the GM of this team. Whether he deserves it or not is a whole other tangent. But that being said... I almost felt like this was more of a collaborative effort between the two. But then you might say, well, if it was between the two, wouldn't the third guy, Lori, be involved in the decision-making as well? Eh, most likely. And, yeah. it, you know, it made me think of would have liked to have been a fly, even without audio, a fly in the wall, uh, on the wall in the room, just to see the seating arrangement. Because that could tell you something as to were Lori and Roseman on one side of the desk and Siri on the other, or was it Sirianni and Roseman on one side of the desk and Lori on the other? That might have been. A I think it was idea. one on. I think it was one on one, and 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 Jeffrey made it. Uh, you don't think or, Howie was in the room no, when Sirianni no, made his presentation? No. And here's how I'm going to fix the Eagles. Nope. Really? Um, nope. In fact, um, and Jeff McLean was the first to uh, uh, break this, um, so I'll give him credit. Uh, 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 Nick Sirianni doesn't report to Howie Roseman. Nick Sirianni reports to Jeffrey Lurie. That's it. Uh, he split it. Uh, so Howie reports to Jeffrey. Nick reports to Jeffrey. Uh, one thing he said at the beginning. Um, same business so is it too- misunderstood by the fans and people? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, how yeah. much say or not say, but 
that I, I feel like people think Roseman is basically like this yeah, guy who's it, in yeah, charge of everything. Yeah, a lot of people do. Yeah, it's completely misunderstood. Um, but from Jeffrey's perspective, and he started the whole process of no, nothing changed. We had the same meeting we always have, and he has meetings with Howie. He has meetings with Nick after the season. He has meetings with head coach. He did it with Nick, everybody, obviously. He does it every year, same way. And he said there's no biases. There's no recency bias. There's no licency bias. There's no bias whatsoever. Yeah. Um, and this is the conclusion I came to. Now, all of that is kind of who he is, I said. It doesn't matter. But, no, I don't believe – no, he he meets with them separately. Nick had to have his plan. How he's got to have his plan. How his plan more revolves around personnel, um, and obviously Nick, the coaching staff, and all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, I think it's very misunderstood. I really do. Yeah, I'm, yeah. He um, he opened up, and, and look, I give Lori credit for the way that he presents this. As hey, listen. We didn't want to look at the last six games. We wanted to look at the 31 and seven. That's a really good record, which I do to agree with. Sometimes as fans, people only want to take the most recent thing that you saw, which was a disaster. And I think we all acknowledge that. But in that you're saying, well, then how did you get to 31 and seven? Is there anything in 31 and seven, three playoff appearances and a Super Bowl appearance that is still in there? And I think <laughs> – Astutely, he said, there has to be. So what happened in those last seven? I don't know. But I was willing to find out if that is going to rear its ugly head when this season starts again and give this guy another shot. To which people then say, well, now you put the guy in a bad spot because he's a lame duck. And it, the appearance is that he's just kind of here for you know, whatever reason, so that you can control the narrative that you hit these coaches all the time, whatever it might be. I, uh, my, me, oh, go ahead, Jody. Yeah, let me uh, – let, and uh, the people on the stream aren't happy with me because I'm apparently creating a controversy that isn't there. I'm just giving you my opinion. I'm just giving you what I heard yesterday out of Nick Sirianni, and I'm going to give you another thing I didn't necessarily understand and or like. He said that Kellen Moore, who he hired – not we hired, I hired Kellen Moore um, – is come in – and he's doing a good job, and he's working hard. And then when he was asked about, well, what's the offense really going to look like with you and Kellen Moore? You've been an offensive coach. He's your new offensive quarter. The answer is, I don't know. I don't know. Wait a minute. You just told me he showed up. He's working hard. He's fitting in. But the offense is going to be, I don't know. Wait, it can't be both of these things. Either you like your hire, it's working out, and here's what it's probably going to look like. I didn't expect them to start drawing up plays and telling us, here's the percentages of run to pass. Or whatever. You didn't have to get real specific, but I would have expected better than I don't know. That's what we got out of him yesterday when asked how he and Kellen Moore are going to be able to put the offense together. Is yeah. that not disconcerting? Well, I mean, it, it's funny. I was so yesterday in my travels to the airport, the gentleman who gave me a ride to the airport happens to be the Tampa Bay Buccaneers radio um, sideline guy. So he was laughing about how the owners meetings are an hour up the road in Tampa and that the Glazers never speak. Their office is across the street from where we were sitting, but they have to drive an hour to go actually talk to the owner for the only time he'll talk all year long to which he said, why the hell are people going to listen to these guys talk in March? Who cares? And I said, you obviously don't live in the Northeast where they will literally sit on every word and how it's said in the month of March. So mm -hmm. if this was August and maybe they had been on the field a few times, they haven't even had a mini camp yet to see uh, some seven on seven. I may read a little bit more into that, but you know, he mentioned yesterday about Saquon Barkley. Um, and they want to try to, it's like AJ Brown, good players fit well into the scheme. Uh, he's a really good player. What's he going to look like in there? Well, I don't know. We haven't even been on the field yet. I kind of took it more like that than the concern that you said you might have. So I might be more in the TJ camp on this one where it's March. I'll wait to uh, reserve judgment to see if this offense 
has some sort of identity, which I'm very intrigued, Jody, on what the identity will be this year. Because last year, they had none. Um, well, I would say to Jody's point, I mean, he was in competitive advantage mode. Oh. So it's not like he doesn't know. There's that it's as well. He doesn't, he, yeah, you know, which I, I agree is silly, but I mean, that's what it is. He wouldn't even name, he named Cam Jurgens the starting center the day before, and he wouldn't do it in front of the Philly reporters. Oh, well, we, we got time. I well, he tried to, to compare team. the whole offense. You know, we got AJ, we had to find out what he did well. Yeah. I don't know. I guess you traded for a guy that you didn't know what he did well. That doesn't sound to be. I mean, you've seen Saquon Barkley for the last five years. Do you not know what he got to well, figure out what he the, does well? Yeah. There could be the element that you think that he can do more well than the Giants got out of him. Well, yeah, better. Yeah. Better and I think that's what the paycheck says. Yeah. yeah. Um, speaking of uh, the paycheck of Saquon Barkley, uh, one one interesting thing Jeffrey said um, was taking advantage of market inefficiencies. Or oh, is that Howie? I'm getting it all conflated. Um, which I think that was a Jeffrey thing. Yeah, yeah, Jeffrey. Which you know is Howie playing 3D chess and and saying let's create this market inefficiency and then seize on that market inefficiency? Is that what we're doing? Is that how advanced Howie Roseman is? That's a you know it's funny you say that because at at any like they're just I, I was on vacation last week and I feel like every day I was like they got what they got this guy there's guys I've lost track now with guys they're still bringing in it's just a joke of like what the salary cap is and who's in circumventing it and how you're doing it and you're talking about inefficiencies I don't think they're looking at that number at all he just I said but this is the thing to me that is crazy when this all when I always think about it, I said. He can't be the only one that knows how to do all this stuff. It, yeah, it's, you would think. Well, people, um, you know, it was ironic. I think it was Brandon Bean. I think it was Buffalo who thought they were going to get compensatory picks are a big thing. Usually Nick Court or Corte, I, I, don't, I don't know how. He does a real Jimmy Kemsky locally, but Nick nationally, he almost gets those things right every year, understands it. He got it wrong. And for the first time, the NFL teams thought, like Buffalo thought they were getting a third-round compensatory pick. It turned into a fourth round. And they were like, what's going on here? And evidently, it had something to do with voidable years. The Eagles are at the forefront of that. And it yep. changed the, the, the contractual thing. And it knocked them down. I think the NFL teams are starting to catch up because everybody's doing it now. And I think the NFL is going to stop it or at least – put more of a limit on it at some point, or I think they're going to look at it. Yeah, it's like a Google algorithm. You're like trying yeah. to figure out what they changed to get your, you know, website higher up. I I was trying to think of this. The last time I was on the air was uh, last Tuesday. And we were talking about when was the time, is there a player that the Eagles had to cut because of financial re They just – like Sandy, uh, the, the Chargers, they were cutting guys they didn't want to cut. Buffalo were cutting guys they didn't want to cut. They just couldn't figure out ways to keep them. I can't figure out a time where the Eagles just flat out couldn't keep a guy because of a mistake or the way they handled the cap. Well, and you know who deserves credit for that? It, it is Howie and it's Jake Rosenberg and it's Bryce Johnston and all his lieutenants, but it, that's Jeffrey. That's where Jeffrey gets a plus marks because there are certain teams that won't. The salary cap is bookkeeping. Yeah, yeah, that's all it is. It's accounting. That that's that's all it is. The real money is what matters and what you're willing to pay out. And there's some people that aren't willing to pay out. You know, think of it, Jody. You're a baseball guy, Bobby Bonilla Day. You know how many how many years, how many deferred payments. Uh, are they paying Bobby Bonilla? Are they still paying Bobby yeah, Bonilla? Oh, yeah. Yeah. He's got like 10 more years to go. Well, some owners don't want to do that. Right. Um, and and be years down the road and paying guys who, who uh, and, and, and it's not even paying because the money's already outlaid. It's about, it's on the books, uh, on the books. Uh, in the case of the NFL, in the case of these voidable years, like Jason Kelsey's still on the books. Fletcher Cox still on the books. They're not playing for the Eagles anymore. I had a bunch of fans say, that's not fair. 
it's not new money. It's accounting. They haven't accounted for the money they've already paid. A lot of owners aren't willing to do that. Jeffrey's like, yeah, go ahead, do it. Carson Wentz, we had that discussion how many times, Jody, during that offseason? Most dead money in NFL history. Yep. Now, how much did Denver pay Russell Wilson to get the hell out of town? How much was that? that well, the Eagles kind of set yeah. the precedent. Yeah. The, Eagle, the Eagles kind of set the precedent on that. I mean, yes. I remember – um, when they made the Wentz move, I mean, Andrew Brandt, who had been working uh, the league for he was this he was is like, not yeah. happening. There's no way the Eagles are going to do that dead money because it was unheard of. Exactly. It was unheard of. So, unheard when, they, of. when they did that move with the dead money that they ended up accumulating, it, it was unheard. And now other teams are saying, Well, if they did it, <laughs> we can figure out a way to do it too. And yeah. oh, being ahead of the curve is. 90% of the time a winner. Sometimes you're ahead of the curve and you're wrong, but not often. More often than the time, if you're ahead of the curve, you're getting it right. And specifically with the Eagles, so I believe that's I guess, the case. I guess the, the, the follow-up in my mind would be is the value that Roseman brings in those areas so valuable that he does get the lifetime pass almost. Because you always say in these situations, I always think of it like this, like, you know, we've all worked in – Jody, you've been in radio for a while. The engineer is a guy that's always like, hey, don't talk to the engineer. He's a he's a guy that eh. – Torture he's, he's the only one that knows how to fix the stuff. And I think Lori and Roseman are this team that they create the stuff and they might make mistakes and they might have things go wrong. But they also know how to get out. And some people will say, well, he made all these mistakes, but he also knows how to fix them. Fix them, right. And is that is that is that worth enough that he would be um, able to be making all these decisions and be a part of all these conversations? If you think that he's a part of the coaching hires and 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 all that stuff. Well, John and I said earlier, John's ninety five percent. I'm ninety nine percent on Howie lifetime contract, and lifetime for me is up until Julian takes over. Then then you you got yeah Jeffrey's lifetime yeah. Right. yeah Jeffrey's lifetime is owner. Yeah. Yeah, John's at 99. I'm, I right, said, so what's John's the relationship between Julian and Howie? I mean, was Howie like his well, baby we don't know. at some point I, or what? I, I, I mean, Julian's much younger. He's very close to Alec Hallaby. So who knows? Alec Hallaby might be Julian's Howie Roseman. Right. Who knows? And then all Howie's time. not an old guy. No, he's not. No, but he's but he's been around for a long time. He's been around a while, which is another fascinating story is that he never thought to leave. No one ever approached him. I mean, Philadelphia is a glamour job, but it's not the most glamorous job. Well, nobody wanted him after uh, Chip. He was demoted, and and that's another thing. I and oh, that's why I'm at ninety five, Mike. Um, Jeffrey Lurie already had this type of relationship with Joe Banner, and they had a uh, 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 dust up, and and he moved on. Um, that was a childhood friend. That's how close he was to Joe. Um, and he already demoted how he wants. Now he calls it his greatest mistake. So I think he real, and it was by the way, um, you know, now, and I say demoted, he gave him a raise while doing it and he gave him a new shiny new job title. But the bottom line is he took away what, how he wanted most. And that was the personnel aspect of the job. So he's done it before. That's why I can't get to 100. But, yeah, all the other GMs have to GM for their job, is how I disclaim. Uh, Brian Poles, who I criticize a lot. The NFC North, Kwesi Ojopa Mensa. He's done. He's croaked. He's done. Um, those guys get two, three years windows, and that's it. That's it. Um, and if it's not looking good, they're going to move on to the next guy. Howie. He's got the the rope to make mistakes, and that's the most important part of it because everybody makes thing, mistakes. Everybody tries to emulate a lot of what the Eagles do by hiring their minions, but the one thing they don't emulate is the patience they have had. Yes, yes, yes. And I, let, let me say this. This is probably going to get me in trouble, but I'm sorry. I just love to tell this story, and I don't think I've ever told it in three years on Birds 365. Jeffrey Laurie, God bless him. We love him. He's a great owner. He can be worked. And I think that's what got Joe Banner fired. He didn't know how to work Jeff Laurie. Others have figured out how to work Jeff Laurie. 
Howie Roseman is sure as hell figured out to work Jeff Lurie. I think we're seeing this offseason. Nick Sirianni has learned to work Jeff Lurie in that, like you said, John, he could read the room ahead of time. And he knew how to enter specific conversations and meetings and give the owner what he wanted as best he could to a point. Doug Peterson couldn't work him. Doug, Doug, Doug just didn't attempt to work him. He just said, he no, didn't want look, he didn't want you later by. At the end, yeah. At the I, end. A former Eagle coach under Jeff Lurie, which kind of swings the, shrinks the room real fast. There haven't been all that many of them, um, told me that there was a year where they specifically wanted one player in the first round of the draft that thought they were, were going to get him. And Jeff used to they had meetings and inquisitions and what we like, whatever. And he had his video guy put together a tape of the five or six potential choices at the position they were looking at, blah, blah, blah. And he sat down there and watched the guy edit the tape and helped him edit the tape and put together the tape. And then they handed it to Jeff. Jeff, we'd like your input on this. And the tape was edited specifically for pointing to this one player that the coach wanted to take, that he really thought was the guy to take. And they did some very good editing. You can edit anything to make it look good or look bad. So they give Jeff the tape. He comes back the next day and specifically says, oh, uh, I'm off this, there's no question. I would say this is the player we should be leaning toward. And they go, really, Jeffrey? Is that the guy you like? Yeah, of course it's a, He's much the best. Oh, okay, we'll, then, then we'll lean in that direction. And that's the exact player that they took. They worked him. People who worked all the time. And Jeff Laurie, as great as he is, can be worked. And I think he got worked a little this offseason by Nick Sirianni. I think Sirianni did a great job of keeping his job, of knowing what to say, on knowing how to say it, and that helped save his job. And I don't know if that's a good thing or bad thing. Well, I was just going, I was going to say, well, then credit Sirianni then. <laughs> like, I give him credit for saving his job, but I'm looking at it from what is best for the Philadelphia Eagles, not what's best for Nick Sirianni. And ever since, and because I was one that said, I think Nick should keep his job. I was kind of in line with that, with what he had accomplished over the enti entirety of his three-year career as Eagle coach. The way he's handling his I business. Say, he works Jeff Laurie, but he can't work us as Eagle well, fans. Whatever. Well, I'm not going <coughs> to tell you Gam Jorgens is my center. He doesn't even attempt to work us. He doesn't give a crap about us. He, no. he worries well, about his job. No, he doesn't uh, give a crap. But isn't that isn't that a good thing that he? I mean, yeah. it's he funny. shouldn't. Yeah, he's he funny. He's the pander in chief in some aspects, but that's him. So maybe Sirianni's a little smarter than people want to give him credit. Ah, uh, yeah, he definitely cool. is. Oh, well, that first of all, yeah, I mean, yeah, I I coined the pander in chief. I'm taking yeah. credit for that. Yeah. Um, victory lap. I, you know, yeah, the goopiness about putting on the Phillies shirts and the and the Sixers and the Flyers. I mean, yeah, he he knows, and he's a Pirates fan and all this crap, and no, nobody knows and nobody cares, uh, nor should they. Um, it's not his job. His job is to coach the Philadelphia Eagles, but yeah, he's very good with that kind of stuff. And and I don't want to say if it's manipulating, you know, that takes on a negative connotation, um, but. That's this whole thing, connecting with people. You know, how do you connect with a, a Philadelphia sports fan? That's pretty easy if you really think about it. Four for four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, Maybe he's smart. He's smart. last year. See, uh, the story the other day about Bill Self basically admitting that he was already thinking about next year. I mean, maybe Sirianni with that team last year was just like, I'm done with this team and just knew not to say it. Well. Yeah, he better not say that. But that's my one concern. Exactly. But I'm saying, like, yeah. so he read the room enough to be like, I'm done with this was, team, man. Was it, when, was it when Jonathan Gannon poked him in the eye at home that he said, we can't beat friggin' Jonathan Gannon and his Cardinals? Yeah. We're screwed. We but suck. The, Let's give up. This goes back to the Carton stuff where, like, maybe there was just something that he was like, you know what? I'm done dealing with these guys in here, man. It's just what happened to the Carton stuff, by the way? That's the first time I heard it. It's going to yeah, happen any funny. day now. It's any day now, that's going to come to light. Um, you know, it, it is funny when you talk about uh, uh, Nick Sirianni. It was Randy. We had Randy Mueller on. and I Because Jody will tell you, I was in the camp of, you can't fire this guy. It's ridiculous. 
31 and seven. Jeffrey, I did agree with what you said earlier, John. And I said the same thing on my show, which was if he made the decision to fire the defensive coordinator, that was a fireball. Yeah, offense because I of the agree. Result. The I result agree. of I got, that, was, I got that from me since we're laying claim to things. Yeah. I yeah, was the was result that's a of that offense. You make that decision, and the guy you put in is worse than the yeah. guy you said is fireable. Yeah. I said, I, I said that if you wanted Nick Sirianni fired, everybody was saying offense this, offense that. They were top ten in every stinking meaningful offensive category. Don't start with that. Start with Sean Desai. If you want him fired, that was the biggest mistake. But Randy brought up, and I admit this made me think. He, he said, your job as an NFL coach is to fix things. That's it. He couldn't fix anything. And then I started thinking about that because I kept, I, I, I was like, there's no way this team could be that bad. You know, yeah, they're going to beat Arizona. They couldn't beat Arizona. <laughs> they're going to beat Tampa Giants. Bay. And they're going to beat the Giants. They, you know, they couldn't do anything. They couldn't fix anything. And that's in that final stretch. So it made me think, I'm like, you know what? Because I think to this day, Mike, they don't know what the hell happened. They still don't know. No. no. And I think like, you know, when I had Fletcher Cox on at the Super Bowl, he, he was like, I'm still like, I, I can't even come up with an, a reason. Britton Covey, a guy on the offense. Well, you know, obviously Britton doesn't play a lot of offense, but I thought his comments were very like, it was, and this could be Sirianni a little bit. I guess you can read it that way if you like. But, you know, when he said teams got better as the season went on and we didn't, we yeah. did not make adjustments. Teams adjusted to us and we didn't adjust to them. And who's at fault for that? I guess you got to put the head coach in that to some extent. But there's also the element that I do understand that maybe he felt he had the wrong people in place. Yeah, but he hired him. The one sure. thing we found out is but, he hired him. They weren't like on him. They weren't how he hires. They were Sirianni fires. So if you got the wrong people in place, who's the blame? You oh, are. No, no question. But like Roseman, they like the guy enough to say you made a mistake. You're admitting your mistake. Now fix the mistake. And if you don't, now we have problems. Yeah. And that's where I think we are. And by the way, Jeffrey brought up San Francisco last year had major struggles when they had some injuries, when they lose three straight games, they recovered. Um, Kansas City had a bunch of struggles, recovered, and and we weren't able to. He mentioned those two teams specifically as being able to go through the adversity, figure it out, and have coaches that fix things. Nick Sirianni wasn't able to do that, and that's – uh, I'll leave it there. My last one at Mike Gill show. You back on the air today, Mike? Ninety-seven three ESPN South Jersey. I back am on the air today. Yes, back on the air two to six. So everybody locally tune in to to Mike this afternoon. Um, it, it, it you know it, if you bring in um, um, new coordinators and Jeffrey made this big, I think he called coordinators. I think is. Exact quote was coordinators are so important. So he did the old Jeffrey Lorry thing. He scapegoated, does it very nicely, very eloquently, very professorally, but he scapegoated and blamed it on the coordinators, as essentially Nick Sirianni did to save his job. Now there's no more excuses. It is Nick Sir Sirianni on the hot seat? Is he going to get fired if this team? doesn't reach these massive expectations and you put whatever expectations you want, but now they have the weapon and Saquon Barkley. They have everything on offense. They have these two great coordinators. Um, what are the expectations? And if Nick Sirianni doesn't reach him, is he gone? Uh, I would say, yes, he was firmly on the hot seat. Um, that's should be pretty evident. Um, what are the expectations? Well, I think you're going to see a team. People might be like, how is this possible? Uh, the first power ranking of the year, they're in the top eight. So that's a team that probably has Super Bowl expectations in today's NFL. You know, you have a window of about five to eight teams that you probably think are in that. By the way, I'm surprised they're that low now after free agency. 
because I think so many are so hyped about Saquon. I expected him to be top five by now in those goofy well, power rankings. And then, of course, uh, you have the draft coming up, and we'll see how that shifts people's – you know, people were excited about this team after the draft last year after what they were able to do. So we'll see if that even shifts the excitement even more. So with all of that, the amount of moves they made – I would imagine that the interest and the hype and the expectations are going to be right back to where we're used to them being. So that would put you firmly on the hot seat. I saw one power ranking this morning that had him at six, number six in the NFL. Yeah. There you go. Uh, right. Pinching up. Uh, uh, last thing this is a me, team that, got, that lost six out of its last seven games. And they're, they're saying, you know what? Don't care. We trust what they do enough and what they've done this offseason enough to forget about that little seven game stretch. That's like Jeff Flory with uh, Nick Sirianni. Um, here's my last question, Mike Gill. Will you be using that $50 stipend that you got from X airport, X uh, airline, um, to be making your travel plans to Brazil for the Eagle game, and the first Paolo. Friday of the season? That'll take out. So Big. Hello, Brazil. You're a world traveler. You're a bon vivant kind of guy. Jeff Laurie was selling yesterday. He talked up Brazil like it's going to be the greatest game in the history of the NFL, and the Eagles are the forerunners, and they're cutting edge, and they're doing it for the league. He was taking a pretty good bow. Are you going to be there for the first South American NFL game, Mike Gill? Uh, a lot of it is contingent on uh, my girlfriend's son, if he gets accepted to the Naval Academy or not, and there is no college tuition, if, there, if that's no. the case. Wow. We do, we do yeah. have it on our uh, our radar because we're going to London. And you got 50 bucks to burn. Yeah. Well, I don't think that airline flies to uh, oh, Rio de Janeiro. Oh, that sucks. Uh, but we are going to London to see the Phils. Cool. And we have discussed – the Brazil trip, and if we don't do that, we might go to WVU Penn State in Morgantown. Yeah, San Paolo or Morgantown. That's a little cheaper yeah. to go to Morgantown than it is to Sao Paulo. You save yeah. a couple bucks doing that one, Gil. Le lean toward that. I go. Friend. I I I would lean towards Morgantown. Don't yes. want to give you any advice, but I would lean towards Morgantown. I haven't been yeah. back since I left. So this really, would be you never wow. made it to a game. You talk them up, you wear the t-shirt, you've never been back since you graduated. It is so it's tough, man, because tough to get there, man. It's a sick, it's not easy to get there. It's a six-hour drive. So to drive six hours to watch a game, to drive six hours home, it's a long weekend. Yeah. All right. I I did what the how long does it take to get to Cleveland? About was was it seven and a half or eight? We drove to Cleveland, yeah. went out for an Eagle game, left the night before, stayed in the hotel, got there late, did the uh, what's the, the bar area in Cleveland? The Flats. flats. flats did the Flats. Yeah. And then went back to the crash, went to the Eagle game, boom, back in the car and drove back to, all in 48 hours. So uh, I've done more than six to, to go watch Eagles. You could do six to go to Morgantown. Uh, always a pleasure, Mike Gill. Appreciate you joining us. Thank you very much for coming back. Welcome we'll back you. with your travel difficulties. And uh, yeah, 50 bucks. Is that you have to use in the airport? Is it food related or just travel? No, I think it's just for booking my next uh, flight. All right. so they, wanna... oh, they, they want you on another flight. Yeah. Exactly yeah. right. Mike, thanks, bud. We'll talk to you next week. All right, everybody. Thanks, Mike Buzz. Gill. 97.3 ESPN down the shore, the Sports Bash host, back on the airwaves this afternoon. Uh, you got McDonald and McMone here on Birds 365. Oh, we got a surprise for you coming up in less than 15 minutes. Stay tuned for details. And Birds fans, if I got an offer for you, how would you like to save generously on your car insurance? How about 40%? on your car insurance. You can do so right now with one of Jacob's Sports' great partners. Here's what you need to do. Call one of their two managing general partners, Fran or Jim, or Jim or Fran, and tell them you're a friend of Jacob's Sports and Birds 365. Hi, I'm Jim Muehlbronner, Managing Partner at DelVal Insurance Group. Give us a call. We're a local, knowledgeable agency, not an 800 number. Go Birds!